Hey guys, it's summertime, and life is all about weekends, cookouts, and all things outdoors. And the JCPenney Men's Store is the place to go for some serious summer style. Where shorts, tees, and swim trunks from brands like St. John's Bay, Dockers, and Izod go for a cool 40 to 50% off. And spend $25 or more with coupon on men's apparel, shoes, and accessories, and you get 10 bucks off. We've got your look, your style, and a great price. The Men's Store at JCPenney. When it fits, you feel it. Coupon valid by 28 to 531. Some exclusions apply. Check JCP.com now or your Thursday newspaper for coupon and details. He and Carlos Stanton and the Miami Marlins travel to New York to face the Mets. We have right field towards the corner. Gone! The pregame's at 3.30 Eastern, followed by first pitch at 4.30. Saturday on ESPN Radio. SVP and Rosillo. The podcast. Hey, it's SVP and Rosillo. We appreciate you checking out the podcast. Adnan in for Ryan. We talked LeBron going to five straight NBA Finals by one big thing on a coach, his coach, that I believe deserves way more credit than he's getting. That's David Blatt. A fun and varied guest list includes Jared Dudley talking about who had the worst braids in the NBA. Buck Showalter on having a gnome made in his likeness. Jeremy Schaap, is he really a spy that has killed people? I didn't ask him that. I asked him about the FIFA mess. Nobody knows the lay of the land better there. And Adnan has a pop quiz for me. Matt, I got something to say. Let me ask you a question. All part of the podcast, it starts now. And Shap didn't kill people that we know of. Allegedly. Now, SVP and Rosillo on ESPN Radio. And ESPNRadio.com. Adnan Burks alongside. Check out Rosillo today. Uh, in for Olbermann Friday as well. That'll be fun. That's a show that, that you know well. This is How much easier will it be for him second time through as opposed to the first time through? I, I think significantly. I thought Ryan did a good job his first time and a couple of good one-liners, did a nice job of the commentary. <laughs> but but now that he kind of understands the, the modus operandi and he can really kind of sink his teeth in, we'll see Salty Rosillo and some of that sarcasm shine through from Times Square. Feel free to explore the space. Really <laughs> find out who Rosillo is. Our show presented by Progressive Insurance. Guest Jonas Subway, Fresh Take, Hotline. You can always tweet us your thoughts, 1-800-Flowers.com, Twitter feed, at SVP and Rosillo. Fun guest list today includes my, uh, my buddy Buck Showalter from the Orioles, Jared Dudley, who, if you've been watching SportsCenter, he is a, a bright and uh, dialed-in guy to all things NBA. We'll talk to him, obviously, about the, uh, the situation with the Cavs moving on. And at the top of the next hour, this FIFA fiasco uh, with Jeremy Schapp, who knows it and the, the principles better than anybody, I believe, here. He and Bob Lee are, are locked into that, so Jeremy Schapp will be here at the top of the hour. Cleveland makes the finals. The last few years, I said last night at Sports Center that, it, that in the last two two years ago, not in the most mescaline fueled dreams could 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 a Cavaliers fan envision a night like last night. You just never dream your guys coming back. You can't imagine you're ever going to matter again as a franchise. And they take out the one seed, Atlanta Hawks, who, by the way, your boy picked to win the Eastern Conference Finals. How'd that one go? I'm sure you were just trying to play with it. Because you know you have a big nope. following in the Dirty South. They nope. the ATL. They love Van Pelt. No, I picked them because I thought they were going to win. <laughs> and, man, hey, listen, it's like losing a game. Would you rather lose at the buzzer or would you rather just get blowed out? We got blowed out in mm-hmm. that pick. That's fine. Uh, I was wrong. And uh, LeBron was sensational. And the role players, neither Knickerbocker has missed, it doesn't seem, in the last month. Shumpert and Smith have taken turns being great. Kyrie Irving comes back last night. But really the discussion, Adnan, I think, should rightfully focus on a guy who is the first non-Celtic from the 60s to make five consecutive trips to, consecutive trips to the NBA Finals. When you think LeBron right now, what, what, what comes to mind for you? Yeah, you're right. When you think about Bob Cousy, Bill Russell, those are the names we're mentioning now with LeBron James. I mean, it's phenomenal. And five straight finals. I mean, I don't think people realize the scrutiny, the, you know, the expectations, the hype, the weight of what he carries day in and day out. It just becomes routine to think, well, he's LeBron. He's the best player in the world. He can get this done. But this was a team that was 19 and 20. This was a team that you thought maybe their head coach was going to be fired. Um, it took a, a drastic and very smart trade. To bring over Timothy Mozgov and to get J.R. Smith and Iman Shumpert in there. So this has been a team that has undergone quite a few transformations, and yet ultimately it ends up being LeBron being magnificent again. And and you mentioned, Scott, the city of Cleveland. I think this bears mention. We all know they haven't won since the 1964 NFL title for the Browns. It's been a minute. But that's a combined 143 consecutive seasons between the Cavaliers, Browns, Indians, and Barons. Shout out to the hockey team from 76 to 78. The next closest to that is San Diego, which is 107 seasons, 
since the Chargers won the title. I mean, every fan base, every fan listing goes, I wish my team had won or you feel star-crossed, no matter what city you're from. You're talking about 143 straight years of not winning a title, and they're four wins away? I mean, celebrate, Cleveland. I mean, go go wild today. They it can only get better. They did. They were going crazy last night. And um, it was it was a few years back. Uh, I hosted it, a, an evening there. It's the Greater Cleveland Sports Awards. And it's a, it's a lovely night. And it's a bunch of great people in Cleveland. And my message to them was, yeah, something good will happen. And when things looked bleak in the last few years, at some point I think I tweeted out, remember that night I said that I had a lot of red wine. Um, I didn't really, but it was just, it, 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 looked, like, it, looked, like, it looked like yet another Van Pelt uh, uh, pick or wish or something that, that had gone off the rails. And I do wish something good for those fans because I think by and large they're an incredibly – passionate and resilient group and they would have to be it's easy to talk about a chicago sports fan and that's a great sports town mm -hmm. chicago a great sports town and it's easy to focus on the cubs who have had as long a drought as anyone the longest but the white Sox won the bulls had a ton the blackhawks have had a ton it's been a while for the bears but they've won so i can't pity you and i'm sure pity to, uh, cleveland doesn't covet pity but that's the when you invest as much as they invest you you'd love to see that rewarded that that loyalty and that passion rewarded and they're four games away from it being rewarded those will be four significant wins to get they'll be dogs in this series against golden state would be my guess but to the point you made about what cleveland was and where they now are lebron spoke to that last night to be able to sit at one point during the season and see us at 19 and 20 and uh, watching my team struggle me sitting out two weeks you know they wanted coach black fired saying we needed another point guard. Um, um, will LeBron and Kyrie be able to play together? And so many storylines were just happening at that point in time. And you know, for us to be sitting at this point today, being able to represent the Eastern Conference in the finals, this is, is special. It's very special. It's SP Pierre Marcillo here on ESPN Radio. Adnan Burke in all three hours today. You can celebrate summer birthdays with a smile. Go to white800flowers.com slash ESPN for flowers and gifts starting at 29 99. A literary reference for you. It was a, oh. to, it was a Tom Wolfe novel back in the late 90s, oh, yes. A Man in Full. Oh, yeah, I love A Man in Full. And it, the All about Atlanta. The, the title, it, it has nothing to do with LeBron James, but the title, I think, speaks to who and what he is right now. We, um, we're, we want everything immediately. We're not good at waiting. And then when we finally get what it is we've waited for, we're in a gigantic hurry to think about what the next thing is, which is why I preach to anybody enjoy the now to okc fans back when they made the finals with that young group enjoy the now oh we're going to be a dynasty are you or is harden going to leave then you're going to have a bunch of injuries and you, you, you haven't made it back yet still can but what lebron is to to at this moment mm -hmm. is a guy who is fully he is completely self-aware he knows who and what he is he knows he truly is the all-powerful ruler of that cleveland franchise i mean gilbert owns it and black coaches it but lebron's in charge right and he has embraced that notion he talks openly about being the leader. Those guys are all going to follow his lead. And he's he's at the place now where he's fully realized his talents and can do, other than make a jumper right now, which he can't, he's, his jumper is busted. <laughs> but it, it, it doesn't stop him. from. He's going to do to you not what you want him to do. He's going to do what he wants to do, and you can't stop him from doing it. And that's a frightening proposition. I don't know how long it lasts, this, this, this mode of him being this good, but he, to me, seems at peak at the peak of his powers, and that's something to behold. And to your point about savoring the moment, that's why I'm kind of resistant to the way that now, and it feels like now more than ever, people have to compartmentalize things and put them into categories. And maybe it's it's probably part of what you have to do every day here on talk radio, and that's create conversation. But I, I'm resistant to the fact that if LeBron wins this, does he become this? Like I, I don't I don't subscribe to that theory. I just like to say, hey, he's made five straight finals. The guy's awesome. I don't want to have to argue. Is he a top five player of all time? Is he a top ten player of all time? Will he be the greatest ever? Like. You know, I don't think you need to have that conversation yet. I want to just enjoy the magic, man. And we'll let Tony and Mike Wilbon have that conversation, which they did on PTI. I do think LeBron needs at least four, maybe five rings, okay. to have this conversation That's seriously. Fair. But That's I also fair. think that as people get stronger and better and nutrition is better and all of that, I think he's the greatest player who ever lived. I really right. do. Because he can play every position on the court. He can defend every position he on can. the court. He, he passes unlike any scorer before him at that size. 
I, I think we're looking at a phenomenal player here, and, and I think the fact that Michael Jordan has six rings will prevent this so, conversation. We're good at counting. Jay Billis made that point, and it's so accurate. And five in a row is something is something uh, remarkable. Uh, it, it's the best, the best ever, the best ever, the best talent ever, the best physical gifts ever versus what Jordan was. The man went six and zero in finals. So it, w these are the age old barbershop bar sports radio. Wherever you want to have the debate and the conversation. Right. I like you am very resistant to the idea of defining. And as I always say, particularly when his particular novel is still being written. Mm -hmm. I mean, we might have we might have more in the book. More of the book might be in the left hand now, but he's still got plenty of book in the right hand, meaning plenty of years to to write what he's whatever it is he's going to write. So, I just admire what what the talents are. I, I believe hearing him be so open and embrace I am the leader and be proud of that and not shrink from that. I think that's just the next step in truly becoming self-aware. Yeah, and considering where they were at one point this season, to go back to Tom Wolf now, I mean, this could be bonfire of the vanities at one point. I mean, if this thing really had blown up. Huh? I didn't even want to make the point. I just wanted to get the bonfire of the vanities line in there. One billion percent. <laughs> he has no point to make other than that he wants to... He wants to one-up my reference about a book, which is fine. You win. Adnan won. Van Pelt, nothing. SVP. Woo! And Rosillo. Good to visit with an old friend, the O's manager, Buck Showalter. And, Buck, I want to I want to start with smiles. I'm not going to wait to get to them. June 27th is Garden Gnome Night when Cleveland comes to town, and I want to know if you're pleased with the likeness. Well, Scott, how are you guys doing today? Are you? Uh, but... Uh... I didn't have anything to do with it, and I have not looked at it, and will not look at it. You look, you like looking in the mirror a lot. I like looking in the mirror when you when you're an honest, upright guy. But looking in the mirror for uh, aesthetics don't work. She, uh, one of our marketing people, brought it down a few days ago. Very proud, wanted to show it to me, and, and uh, they were nicely told that uh, I won't be looking at that. And, uh, but they made a bobblehead. For, they made a bobblehead for me for one of the Orioles uh, minor league affiliates over uh, over there in Bowie. Uh, yeah, I, well, it was not a gnome. It was just a. It was, How can a guy six foot twelve be a gnome? <laughs> I don't know. They just made a bobblehead, and I just I got it. The first one they sent me looked like Winston Churchill. So I'm just saying you should. You, you got enough power and influence that you could make it look like a quite a I handsome gnome. There, there's no way to, to dress this face up. I know. But uh, I'll, you I'll know, when you the way I look at it is you got to worry when they quit asking. You know, they asked me what I thought about it now season i said i'd rather you didn't please don't make it okay thank you and they did it yep that's so, yeah, don't ask me <laughs> understood you know, I'd, I'd always rather it be about the players but uh it's always amazing to me you know the we just came from miami some other uh, mascots and people running around the field it's hard for me to imagine a family force trying to make a decision whether they come in the park or not and they go wait a minute it's gnome night let's go <laughs> people that know people know a lot better than i so uh, it, the imagination of some of the marketing people, we have some great giveaways here. Our, our people do a great job with it. This, I'm not sure if this is one of them. Buck Showalter is our guest. Uh, last night and the game before, I think, Buck, a microcosm of this season, uh, hard-fought games take one step forward, take one step back. How do you best describe sort of the mood around your club in an American League East that the separation between the top and the bottom is basically nil? Well, you know, it's it's one of those times as a manager and coaches and as players that, that we have to trust trust people that to have a good track record. Uh, you know, when you're not swinging a bat very well, you know, your first thing is to give other people credit for pitching well, and then the next that's what kind of makes I don't want to say flat, but just doesn't have a good feel to it. You know, there are times you walk through your clubhouse, there's so many unspoken things that you know you got it going on just to feel from being in, in clubhouses, and uh, there's time you go through there when things aren't aren't uh, right, we're you know not searching for an identity. It's nothing as deep as that. We're we're pitching well. We're not giving our pitchers any margin for error. So every little mistake is magnified. Whether it's a catcher's call or pitch that was thrown in a certain sequence, and nothing that. Uh, and the problem with this is the momentum is always dictated by the next pitcher for you and them. You can score ten runs two times in a row and then run into a solid pitcher, and it'll make you look real flat. So. You try to keep a grip on reality and um, and not have the players. You know, I have a long memory, but at the same time, uh, you know, we've got to do some things better. We haven't. I oh, never. We're going to get start getting some of our people back. Weeders, Maddie caught last night in Bowie and went real well. So that's a good sign. And we, we're getting Ryan Flaherty back today, and 
Norris, Bud Norris, who won 15 games for us, and Kevin Gosman aren't too far away, and a, and a tough loss for us with Jonathan Scope, who uh, we'll get him back at some point. But, you know, the, all of the games count, and nobody wants to hear about your problems. Everybody's got them. And certainly, Buck, in order to that point, I mean, right now, every team is trying to find its identity, and one team that had high expectations is the Miami Marlins, and that has not gone well for them. Mike Redmond gets fired. As you mentioned, you guys just faced the Marlins, and you had this quote talking about Dan Jennings' bullpen moves, and you said they used, what, three guys, three days in a row out of the bullpen to get it done. We'll see how that works down the road. What do you make of that situation in Miami, which everyone seems to have an opinion on? You know, that's their, you know, they know their people a lot better than I. And, uh, those, that, that's, Dan's a good baseball man. He's a good, good guy. I like Dan. I've known him for a long time. And I don't think he would put himself in a position that, uh, that in any form or fashion would hurt his organization. And, uh, I think he may surprise some people. He's got, uh, he's got good baseball knowledge. He's been in locker rooms his whole life. And, uh, you know, just because something's unconventional and hasn't been done before doesn't make it wrong. I mean, that's how we learn different things. That's how we find out that Steve Pierce can play second base. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you just sometimes it was some mother, the mother of necessity or whatever it is, invention, what have you. You guys know all the cliches. That was but, close. Yeah, uh, you know, he's got good. <laughs> he's got good people down there, and Mike Revin's a good baseball manager. One thing you learn about this is you don't take it as personal down the road. You do at the time. You know, every. every Body needs a new voice, and uh, you know the shelf life of managers and coaches has shortened up. We know that, but we're doing something that's very important to a lot of people, and you're going to be critiqued every day. And, and uh, you know, it's a very accountable place, and uh, they're they're a talented club, and uh, they're going to have uh, you know, some quality people to pick from. But the Brian Mattis situation last week, I, I equated it to this. It's it's a bit like a speed trap on the highway if we all know that the, a lot of folks are probably over 55, just, you know, m- maybe you don't go 70. Um, is that a fair way of assessing the way a couple of guys, including one of yours, was was uh, pulled off the mound? Uh, it makes for great uh, – it makes for good uh, knowledgeable feel uh, on radio. You know, everybody thinks, oh, there's a good comparison. You know, it's a <laughs> lot more uh, – you know, I, I think we need to – I think we will. Uh, attack the, the where the problem is, you know, not you know we're dealing with uh, you know what's happening, you know whether uh, a catcher has time throw on his glove or in, you know most infielders have some form of stickiness, or their catcher's got it on his shin. I mean, you can go on and on. And uh, well, let me drop I, the cliches. Is, well, it, is it a point, problem? Is, is it a problem? Well, the, of course it is. The balls are too slick. You know, if you go to the crux of the problem, I mean, we're doing we're, we're doing something that. Uh, Everybody knows about it. We're, we're using a method that we've used forever, you know, putting this uh, kind of mud on the balls, and there's, they're different colors depending on who rubs them up. Umpires don't rub them up anymore. Clubhouse kids do. And, um, you know, the, if, if it's cold or windy or, or you're sweating a lot, I mean, I would, I'd love to, you know, I don't know, you know, guys get hit, you know. I mean, I know Stanton got hit, you know, down uh, one time. Uh, I don't know if that was a ball that got away from a guy that, you know, I'd, I think what you'll see in the future is, is some type of uh, universal, not a pine tar rag, but some type of rag that allows guys to stay. You know, because right now, you, if you're a relief pitcher, you'd like to come in, stand in front of the umpire, and be patted down, then get on with the game. You know, the uh, I, I understand why guys are doing it, but, you know, some of it's so blatant. And, you know, it puts managers in a position where they have to call something on somebody. I'm not, uh, you know, we, we're in the appeal process with Brian, and, it's a whole different case than the guy from two days before. I mean, there was nothing that apparent at all. And, uh, you know, why is there a rosin bag behind the, behind the mound? You know, mm-hmm. and the rosin really doesn't do it, you know. Um, so I think if, you know, if you look at the Japanese baseball, that, that comes with a tacky finish and you play with it right out of the wrapper and it's completely white. I mean, if you watch games that last, uh, you know, three or four hours rain delays, and you know that you can tell they've rubbed up baseballs. They're a different color. They're not quite as rubbed up. You know, there's a real, there's a challenge. The ball that we use, and I think we're gonna, and I know MLB will are looking at it, and I've talked to some people there, and we'll look at a way either do something with the baseballs or or uh, just have a universal uh, rag or something that guys are, are able to use because gripping the baseballs in Oakland at night or San Francisco or some of these places. Uh, where the wind's blowing a lot. I mean, if you look at, I could show you the walk totals in, in games where that weather's there, and it'd be very apparent to you what the problem is. Now, the advantage, disadvantage, you know, someone might say, well, if I can grip my slider better, I'm going to have a better slider. You know, obviously, foreign substances of all that, that 
you know, whether you're scuffing a ball or using Vaseline. That's a completely different subject matter than what we're talking about here. Gotcha. Buck, always appreciate the time. Be well. Go get a win today against Houston. We'll talk again soon, all right? Scott, thanks for having me. I'll take care. SPT and Rosillo. Uh, we've got a killer in the studio. I mean, when I say a killer, I mean a guy that's going to be a monster in this business when he leaves the game. Doesn't need to leave the game anytime soon, but uh, there'll be a home for you here or at some network when the time comes. Jerry Dudley of the Bucks in studio. Uh, Adnan and I started the hour talking about about LeBron. I said he's a man in full. He's at the peak of his powers. He's embracing the role of being a leader. He's talking about it more. Is this current LeBron the best LeBron that you've seen since you've been in the league? It is because I, I think that what he's had to overcome, the adversity, uh, when we we killed him when he played for Dallas, I mean, the Dallas, you know, the, when he basically folded, it was, you know, no show. And that summer, you really see him slowly taking his game. He went down to the low block now. He gets you more at the elbow, kind of how Dirk had you. He's picking and rolling. He he now knows when to pick and choose his spots. You have never saw LeBron shoot 37 times and score, what, 36 points every he had because he always cared about being efficient. He knows he... He has to will his team to win on certain nights, and, and that's what we've seen over LeBron over these last couple of years. I, I right now am saying to LeBron, if I'm trying to, to stop him, I'm going to let you shoot that jumper because it looks busted right, right now. But the problem is I can't prevent him from going where he wants to go. So what's my best – let's say it's Golden State. It's either Golden State or Houston. But let's say it's Golden State. What's, what's the best game plan to try to get him off his spot and stop him from doing what he wants to do? Great question. I, I would look to double him a little bit more. I would. And, and make other guys beat you. I think that LeBron, when he gets going, you can kind of see with LeBron. LeBron kind of baits you. You know how he starts showboating, get it going. You have to get the ball out of his hands. And the thing about LeBron, it's not, not necessarily you know stopping him defensively. You gotta spur him to death. When I mean spur him to death is move that ball offense, offensively, frustrate him, get him down, and make him have to be a one man show. Cause if they don't have, if they don't score enough with Kyrie, if Kyrie's not Kyrie, they're not gonna win this championship. So with the Spurs, kinda like what Golden State does, they move that ball so well, and that three point shot, shot is so devastating LeBron. You can see it kinda when he's playing with Miami. You have to be able to do that because if not, LeBron can't beat you by himself. But if he can take away a couple of your options, that's when he's at his peak. Talking with Jared Dudley right now on SVP and Russillo. Scott and I were mentioning earlier, Jared, the fact that I think the Warriors are clearly the favorite. I mean, if they beat the Rockets, mm -hmm. whether it's in five or six or whatever, I think they win that series. You match them up against Cleveland. I just think they can outscore the Cavaliers. They've got a lot more depth. They come at you in waves. And as brilliant as LeBron is, we've seen Steph Curry, aside from that terrible fall, be just mm -hmm. the magnificent player we all wished he could be. If you're Golden State, I mean, how – first off, do you think it ends in five? And then secondly, how do they match up with Cleveland? Because to me, it doesn't seem like a fair fight on paper. I, I think them – I definitely see Golden State winning tonight at home. This is a team that is it's almost impossible to beat at home. They, they haven't even played extremely well there yet. I, th I see it in tonight. The good thing about Golden State, what they have, Harrison Barnes is a pretty good defender, good body size to go at LeBron. Mm -hmm. Then they come off the bench with Ingodala, and when they go small ball, they have Draymond Green. So out of all the teams that's ever faced him, they have three guys that will probably do one of the best jobs that they can, besides maybe Kawhi Leonard from the Spurs. Then when it comes to offensively about how they are, they space you the floor. Seth Curry is so amazing how he can get into the paint, how he can shoot the three from deep. Um, the thing I would say that is kind of intriguing is with Tristan Thompson emerging, it's, it's like they've actually gotten better without love. And that's oh. because he's such a better defender. Offensive glass. Offensive glass. He's giving you extra possessions. Mm -hmm. And then now he brings like a toughness to him. You know, he, he'll do a hard foul. Something that love is more, more of a finesse player. Mm -hmm. I just think can Shumpert slow down. Um, Steph. Steph. And uh, this will be the best defensive team that he's going against. <laughs> he's not his fingers head no. I, I agree. Good luck, Iman. Yeah. I agree. I'm with him. And, th and that's why I look at this Warriors team overall. I go, okay, this is intriguing to say, mm -hmm. oh, the best player in the world is LeBron James in five straight finals. Right. But ultimately, he doesn't have the horses around him. Only one guy can only do so much. I'm with you. Clay Thompson's going to be big. For them to win, Clay and Draymond Green have to play bad, and they haven't done all year. So why would we expect them to do it now? Do you think Steph has pressure? Because this has been a conversation. It's such a classic talk radio, mm -hmm. low-hanging fruit. Right. But we were comparing, and I said, I think LeBron carries pressure with him because it's based in expectation. And right. I don't believe this year began with Steph feeling the burden of expectation. 
Uh, the, some of the fellows here disagree. They say they think Steph does carry a burden of, of pressure. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, if, if you think that there's there's pressure on Golden State and Steph to win a title this year. I think the pressure is always going to be on LeBron. I think just first Thank he came you. into the league, I think it's the chosen one, how we, hey, this, this you know, obviously stays him. We, we wait for every move decision he does. He's the coach one day. He's the GM another day. We all, it, the, the needle runs through LeBron. Steph, I think the only pressure they had when they were down 2-1, and they answered it brilliantly. They got out there and they answered the bell when they played against Memphis. And I mean, Steph. I mean, come on. He's a, you know, you look at him. He's, everyone's going to root for that superstar, LeBron. He's going to have some naysayers to hate him. And then if he wins it, it's as his legacy. I pulled up some images from the BC days. Um, I just put in Jared Dudley bra <laughs> braids. <laughs> now you had some longer braids. Yes. Um, when you see pictures of those braids, do you? How do you feel about them? You feel like you really had it going? I had it going. You know what? I, I went to school in Boston. We had a lot of girls that were Jamaican that <laughs> loved the braid hair. You know, it would save me some money. They would do it. I had all the designs. You don't see that much in the NBA anymore. I was just, we had this conversation with yeah. Spencer Hawes sent out a joke on, uh, I guess, Instagram, and my man needs to get his <laughs> mind together. Yeah. But there aren't very many. Damari yeah. still got some. Kawhi, yep. not many guys. Who had the worst braids you ever saw? Like a dude that might have had a receding hairline that still tried to, like, look what I got. Uh, he was in football. His name was Jerry Rice. That's one of for basketball player. Uh, <laughs> how are you going to do, do the goat like that? Go, oh, man. That was his, awful. His was terrible. For the Raiders, oh, yeah. it was awful. Uh, for basketball, I mean, basketball, if you come, if you, if you one thing about basketball players, that locker room, they will kill you. So, I mean, you, you don't see really too bad. I mean, I mean, what's his name had a nice one? What's his name? Haslam had some nice Chris ones in Miami. You don't Donna, see too much. Yes. Oh, right. the straight backs, the... The hood brains, you just call them. Love. Crisp ones. Now, yeah. what was your inspiration? Because if it looks so good, like eventually some point somebody either clowned you, a girl said you got to lose that. What? What? I, I'm betting it's the girl. Well, I mean, when, I, when I lost it, I was tired of the NBA getting it taking four hours, basically three hours, you had to blow dry. I was in Phoenix, yeah. and, and you know, Twitter was just getting bad. I was like, you know, I'm going to cut it. And then Jason Richardson's like, all right, do it at my house. So I went over his house, and he was filming. I didn't even know what it was. And he put it on Twitter. I said, well, you know what? It was just something I wanted to change. And you know what it was? Probably Iverson. He cut it. He made it cool. I was like, you know what? If he cuts it, that means it's over. Okay. Now, now I've always wondered. I've always wondered. And obviously, I, I just have to live through others. I have to live through others. It doesn't take me four hours to do nothing. You're, You're saving money. Appreciate the time, my friend. I appreciate it, fellas. Geico presents Strange Saving Stories. Astronomers detected an interstellar transmission. It stated, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The implications were staggering. Was the cosmos telling us we could all save hundreds on car insurance with Geico? Or did their radar merely pick up a signal from the nearby Rufus and Clyde's morning show? We may never know. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. It's time for Scott Van Pelt's One Big Thing. One Big Thing. On ESPN Radio and ESPNRadio.com. So I did Sports Center last night, and when David Blatt, the head coach from the Cleveland Cavaliers, spoke, um, I was paying very close attention. And I was paying very close attention because the manner in which he speaks leads you to pay attention because he's thoughtful. He hears a question, he thinks about the question, and then he answers the question. And it's not coach speak, it's it's real. And nothing could be much more real than this. LeBron came home. I left home to come here. And I left a lot of people that I love dearly, a lot of people that I'm close, so close to, uh, in order to pursue a dream, in order to to do something uh, in my career that I hadn't had the opportunity to do, uh, that's a big sacrifice on the part of uh, my family and, uh, and the place I'm, fr I'm from. And, and uh, you know, it, it's it's special because it's it's all worthwhile. And so last night when. We sent out the email to the show group. I said, I want to do the one big thing tomorrow on Blatt. And then today I'm trying to get some supporting thoughts and facts or whatever to talk about it. And I read Terry Pluto of The Plain Dealer. And his column begins, LeBron came home and I left home to come here. Those words from David Blatt stuck with me. And I thought, you too. And Pluto goes on to explain. It's a column that's, that's really well done and worth reading if, if you are one who looks at Blatt as some guy from Israel that got hired 
in advance of LeBron and sort of lucked his way into this as if he's had nothing to do with it. Just as a side note, uh, if if you want to go get me the list of the rings that Phil Jackson won without two of the greatest players of all time on every team, I'll wait. I'm not telling you Phil's not a, a great coach and a, um, a motivator of men and a blender of egos. He's many, many things, but he won with great players. So the idea that Blatt, because he had a, a bad end game against Chicago, calling a timeout and a play getting overruled by LeBron, like like he's some clown? No, no, no. This is a basketball mind that Steve Kerr, another first-year coach who could meet him in the finals, coveted, wanted to hire to be an assistant out there. A guy who won and won huge overseas. A guy who's from here. He has dual citizenship but grew up in Boston, went to Princeton. Um, it's it, it's so easy for people to marginalize because it's like they prefer to do that rather than ever consider the fact that maybe, just maybe, and that's what Pluto's column gets to, maybe the guy deserves just a little bit of credit. And I would suggest he deserves more than a little bit of credit. Um, none of this happens easily. Granted, he has LeBron. Yeah, but again, most titles are won by the best players in sports. Again, look at any of them. And if you listen to this guy, Adnan, I, I think you'll find, as I have, that he's interesting to listen to. And reading about him and, and just spending a bit more time thinking about him, I, I just at least want to acknowledge that this guy's not just some dude in a suit that rides on the charter. I think it becomes convenient, Scott, for people to kind of just put things into boxes. And the narrative just becomes, LeBron is so incredible, nothing else matters. And it's like it becomes too convenient to take things away and to strip other respect and credit where it should be due. And, and to say that David Blatt's done a good job is not an indictment of anybody else. It doesn't take away from LeBron's greatness. It just adds to the overall picture. And, and Jay Williams even said to me a couple weeks ago that he thought even if the Cavaliers win the championship, Blatt's going to be fired. And I said, how could that happen? They win a championship. And he said, well, he wasn't LeBron's hand-picked guy. He was hired there before LeBron was there. He is the superstar. He is so important. He can pick whoever he wants. But I, I would find it very difficult to imagine this guy wins a title that actually replaces him. He must have had something to do with the success that they've had there. The one caveat to everything that I've said and I mean is LeBron has more juice than anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's got more juice than Tropicana at this point. <laughs> if he wants to go to Dan with Gilbert. With pulp, without pulp, doesn't matter. I don't like the pulp. Just Especially like late at night, you like, bleh, bleh. Anyway, outsider is also down yeah. He gave a head shake. Yep. Me and me and outsider were compadres. We're no just, hope. That's my man right there. <laughs> if if he goes to if he goes to the owner and says, Dan, I don't like this dude. Well, then, not that what I said doesn't matter. It's just he's going to get his way because LeBron's going to get his way. Right. But that I, shouldn't I, disparage I, the fact he's done a good job. I think so, and I, I think that he's just he's a thoughtful guy that knows the game and was brought here as an out of the box hire, and. I thought Pluto did a great job of just illustrating something I hadn't even thought about. But, but when you're an outsider here, he's an outsider to players. Mm -hmm. He's an outsider to coaches. Like, these coaches are part of this fraternity. Oh, absolutely. And so you've got, you got boys. You know, you see that little wave at the end, and I will see you down the road. Like, this is a guy that's part of the fraternity. Well, you're the new kid in school. you got nobody to eat lunch with, so to speak. And I, I, I never really gave much thought to that notion that it, it had to be a bit lonely. You're out on an island. Everybody's looking at you, and they're thinking you're going. They're not. It's not just maybe he's. Oh, he's gone. He's done. He's toast. Right. Just so blatantly dismissed. And um, I just think it's a. I think it's a mistake to marginalize, even though that's sort of the the, the moment of the day. I don't think they're going to win the finals. No, and I don't think that's going to be a reflection of him either. If they lose, exactly. right, right now, Golden City is the clear-cut favorite to win this. I like them to win six games, of course, provided they beat the Rockets tonight or if not in six. But but if they lose, it doesn't. It shouldn't be that David Blatt lost the championship. It should still be he and LeBron James made it to the final. The guy was like 255 and 225 and 55 overseas. Yeah. It's pretty good, huh? They won a bunch of games this year. Yeah, I understand their road hasn't been difficult. And gets tougher. The timeout thing, people are just over dramatized. People make mistakes. Mm -hmm. FIFA just makes more of them. Jeremy Schaap is next. SVP. Woo! And Marcillo. Check out my man uh, Ryan Marcillo hosting Olbermann both today and on Friday. The man who uh, has been hosting it the last couple of days was the first man I thought of. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, Jeremy. But the first man Corruption I thought of. scandals. Yeah, FIFA Shap. scandal, Shap. But as I said in the, in the note to our show staff last night, I said, let, 
Well, I said, Jeremy, and then I said, every single show is going to ask him to be on, and you've been on every show, so just let me say first, sincerely, thank you for spending a bit of time. My pleasure. But you can truly illuminate this better than anybody else here, because you're so well-versed on FIFA, on Bladder, etc. I think the casual fan wants to know, what does this mean? These, 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 there's corruption, fine, you arrest some guys, cool. Bladder's not touched. Does it mean anything to him, and does it mean anything to the, where the World Cup will be played in coming years? It could. We just don't know at this point. Uh, this is a very far-reaching investigation. And as we heard during the press conference from Brooklyn, that extraordinary press conference with the United States Attorney General there, the director of the FBI there, uh, the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District in Brooklyn there, this is not the end. This is merely the beginning. Now, those are the words that would cause some people in Zurich, you would think, to lose some sleep. Uh, not that they haven't been losing sleep anyway over this for quite some while now. Um, how far it reaches, if it reaches into the presidential suite, that is an open question. Of course, we've had scandals before on Sepp Blatter's watch. We've had more sca scandals than we can count on Sepp Blatter's watch. And he's always managed to keep uh, himself at least at some distance from those who have been accused and those who have been convicted and those who have been drummed out of soccer, even those people on the executive committee, which is as close as you can get to the presidential suite without actually being in it. Can I ask how? Because I, it doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> the that, Teflon Don. I mean, if, if, if he's the head of this and the tentacles reach to him, how is he in this in this room that is somehow uh, free of toxins that, that, that he lords over? Well, it's like those movies you see, right, where, you know, some fictional president doesn't order... Uh, you know, the special ops guy to assassinate someone. You know, he just says, you know, fix this problem or make something like that. You know, I, you know, I, I don't want to make, um, I understand. you know, analogies that are that dark. I mean, that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about murder. Um, but you also have to understand, uh, you know, what we've seen from guys like Chuck Blazer and Jack Warner, uh, Chuck Blazer who pleaded guilty. Uh, to charges related to this investigation. Jack Warner is accused of taking millions just to line his own pockets. No one that I know, and I've interviewed so many people close to Sepp Blatter, I've interviewed Sepp Blatter himself, no one says they think that he is actually taking cash and putting it in his pocket. He doesn't have to. I'm not saying he would if it were offered, but he doesn't have to. He lives very nicely in Zurich. All of his expenses are paid. He makes millions and millions of dollars a year, not as many millions as Roger Goodell. Um, and um, I believe that there is probably some degree of plausible deniability. I mean, we can't say that he has done the things that our, our federal government is alleging that so many of these others did, which is taking kickbacks from marketing companies in exchange for getting uh, the right to negotiate uh, and sell the TV rights and the sponsorship and the marketing and all that kind of stuff. Who does Seth Blatter prefer talking to? You're a Bob Lee. Do you think you have a soft spot with him? You know, I, I mean, I, I sat down with him once in 2006 in Zurich. I thought it went well, um, you know, but I, I, I guess uh, he's decided it would be in his best interest not to talk to anyone <laughs> from the United States at this point. I can understand that. Talk with the great Jeremy Schaap right now. Canada is another <laughs> matter entirely. <laughs> exactly. Canada on that list. The question that Scott and I raised earlier is, is this a Qatar mess, not Qatar, Qatar, 2022? I say Qatar. Thank but, you. But I, that's, that's, that's what I say. That's what I was taught. I was there. Right. The people Bro, Bro, I know. Brokaw said it 16 different times I, I, over the course of about five months, I, and I defer to him, I, and I just don't know where to go. You know, I, I, I didn't correct Bob Lee. Bob's got his way of doing <laughs> right. it. David Lloyd's got his way. <laughs> I go with Qatar, and I'm committed to that. I love it. I'm now back all in on Qatar. No, Qatar. Okay. Qatar. I'll give up now. <laughs> this was just a mess to begin with, right, Jeremy? Even the most oh, casual of observers yeah. goes, hang on a second. How are you going to play this right. in 2022 in the summer? Oh, this was the winter. second guess. Right. This was first guess. At the moment, you know, people's eyes popped out of their heads. <laughs> right. What? said, Qatar, that doesn't make any sense. It got the worst assessment from the technical committee, you can't actually have a World Cup there in the summertime. Uh, you know, the country is physically the size of Connecticut. It's got a lot fewer people than Connecticut. It's got all these human rights issues, which were never even addressed in the process of determining whether it would be the host for 2022. Uh, it didn't make sense uh, in any logical way. It made sense 
if you know the history of FIFA under Sepp Blatter and his connect his connection mm-hmm. with Qatar going back to the time he was first elected president in 1998. Is there any chance that this can get moved to the U.S. or England or somewhere else? Or is this pretty much, this is what it's going to be, come hell or high water? I, you know, a lot of people are asking that question. Um, if you'd asked me yesterday, I would have said 100%. 2018 is in Russia. 2022 is in Qatar. Sepp Blatter has said, essentially, over my dead body, is this getting moved? Yeah. Um, you know, what we've learned in the last 24 hours, uh, or less than that, doesn't change that. And, you know, again, what we're talking about with uh, the federal investigation is more about uh, the South, South American Confederation, the North American Confederation, events around that, not so much with uh, the vote that took place on December 2nd, 2010. Um, however, things can change, as we all know. But if you were to ask me as a, as a betting man, uh, <laughs> I would say, uh, you know, uh, pack your sunscreen for November 2022. Jeremy Schaff is our guest. Your piece on the cost, not monetary, but in but in human cost and, and, and the workers that, that are there, many of which, if I understand correctly, Nepalese workers that can't get back home. Uh, they're forbidden That's from right. going back home in the wake Without of this. permission of their employer. From this horrific uh, earthquake there. Is, is there some, is there anybody that has any humanity that looks at this and says, the cost has been such, both monetary and in human terms, that as much as moving it makes sense, you almost can't move off of it. Does that make it, does that make any sense? They've invested so much, so many lives have been lost, so much money. I mean, granted, we've got some time here, but that as flawed as it is, that we that we have to move forward because of what we've done already. No, I, I don't think that's it. I, I, I think um, I think what you can say is that if for some reason somehow uh, a, a change is affected and they move the World Cup out of Qatar, then what happens to all those workers who are there? building other infrastructure projects. And Qatar is very ambitious. Uh, you know, it, it wants to be um, like Dubai. It, it wants to be a global focal point. In many ways, it already is. It wants to punch above its weight. It's going to continue to build and build and build. It is, by many measures, the richest country in the world. And I think the best resolution wouldn't be, let's move the World Cup somewhere else and the world's attention uh uh, shifts from the humani- humanitarian plight of these workers, but they do change the conditions in which these workers live, and their rights are restored, and, and they are granted the freedoms that all of us would like. That would be the best resolution. That would be what FIFA says it stands for, you know, for the world, for the game, which, uh, you know, we heard uh, uh, the Department of Justice representatives turn on its head today, uh, saying this is the World Cup of greed. Ultimately, is this a good a good day for the sport, Jeremy? Because you say, listen, the headline is we're clearing this up. As bad as Balco was for baseball, the headline is we're catching some of the cheaters. In this case, we're getting the guys who are bribing. We should be praising this, right? I don't think there's any doubt about that. It's a bad day for FIFA. It's a good day for soccer. Uh, and it's a good day for people who care about soccer, and especially uh, over in England where I spent some time reporting reporting that show. That is really the place where – the criticism of Sepp Blatter and his thief is most vehement. Uh, they consider themselves the guardians, the custodians of the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was so much frustration all over the world that no one could touch this organization. A- and now the United States, uh, which considers itself in many ways the policeman of the world, ha- has, has very strongly uh, come out and said, we are not going to allow this to continue. Just as a final thought, that, that's a noble thought, but it strikes me that much like wearing white shoes and walking through mud, it would be implausible to think that organizations with so many third world reaches where, where things could be ill-gotten, that, that you're ever truly going to have a, a, a level playing field where things couldn't be bought. Is that reasonable? Well, you know, of course, where there's money, there is corruption, and the problem with FIFA has been systemic. Uh, it operates without any clear oversight from the Swiss government. Uh, you know, we know very little about its inner workings. Its minutes aren't published. The salaries of its employees aren't published. The way that it distributes money around the world. These are things that are largely unknown to us. There is a movement afoot in Switzerland to change that, to change its designation from an official nonprofit, just like 
uh, a yodeling association, as uh, the FIFA critics like to say, to something uh, that would be more like a big multinational corporation that would have to account for itself. And if that happens, you would expect there to be more transparency, more accountability, um, and, and it would be cleaned up. Uh, you know, that might have happened in 1998 when Sepp Blatter was first elected. He was running against someone who was running as a reformer. Leonard Johansson was the president of UEFA, the European Confederation. Uh, and and Johansson lost. And many people say he lost because votes were purchased for Blatter. Not necessarily by, but for Blatter. Um, Johansson lost. We would have a different FIFA today if Johansson had won, I think. And in a word, Blatter will win re-election this week, yes or no? I think so. Overwhelming is what I'm reading. Yeah, and so it goes. Uh, it's it's tr- it I it's truly fascinating to me. Uh, I can't imagine. I don't know. I, in my head spins, and I appreciate you trying to help us uh, have some clarity here in something that's so muddy. I appreciate it, Jeremy. My pleasure, Dad. Major League Baseball on ESPN Radio. This season, the Mets have been a tale of two teams: one of the league's best at home, and one of the worst on the road. Towards the corner. And they'll be at home at City Field facing the Marlins. Will their home field domination continue, or will Giancarlo Stanton lead Miami to a road win? The Mets and Marlins. The pregame's at 3.30 Eastern, followed by the first pitch at 4.30. Saturday on ESPN Radio and the new ESPN app. SPP and Rosillo. Which habit would you find most difficult to give up, Scott? Diet Coke, chewing ice, or checking your phone incessantly? Diet Coke, it's it's chemical. Uh, the phone would be a real problem. Uh, the ice is simply a matter of there's no more Diet Coke in it, and I, I require a liquid. Um, How many years have you been drinking Diet Coke? Uh, I mean, I'm a lab rat. Like when I like it could I could come any day now. Like I'll die and I'll just go. Oh, his liver, his liver weighed 90 pounds, <laughs> and it was just corroded by it's, Diet Coke. It started one summer when I was a lifeguard at the Norbeck Country Club, and the Diet Coke machine button was broken, and so you just could press it and get one for free. Mm. So it's 90 degrees, free Diet Coke, boom. It tasted like I don't know what at first, and then it became it became, uh, it became your thing. One a day? One? Three. Three? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's diet. It's, it's fine. It's double <laughs> digits, bro. It's a problem. That would be my biggest problem. Who's your favorite all-time celebrity crush? Everybody's got one. Who, who was the lady that you were pining for at one point in your life? Um, currently, Emma Stone. I just think she's delightful. Yeah, she's pretty sweet. She's, uh, she seems funny. She seems, And she seems like I, I think she'd like me because I think we'd, we'd laugh and we'd have a time. Quirky and such. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, who. Halle Berry, Brian Carey. No. Or, Kathy Ireland. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I mean, I'm just, I'm picking, I'm trying to pick. Pamela who, Anderson. I don't know. No, I mean, I, 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 I don't think. Alyssa I mean, Milano. I had a, no. <laughs> Jessica you, Alba. She was, a, she's attractive. Yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know that I was ever. I mean, I like think high I just, school Van Pelt wasn't like, man, I'd like to get with. Oh yeah, I don't know. I can't. I, I just, that was so, so long. Did you have any posters? No posters. Yeah, I mean, I think as a kid, like every kid had like the Farrah Fawcett poster. That right. was back late seventies. Bridget Bardot or Marilyn. Monroe. What am I? Like the fifties? <laughs> no. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't have. You know who? What Samantha I was, Fox. Megan Fox. Megan Fox? Samantha Fox. <laughs> no. When not you see that blonde? <laughs> yeah. Come on, brother. Tiffany? <laughs> Next question. You're a funny guy. Some of my favorite all-time story. comedies in terms of shows. Uh-huh. I love the Larry Sanders show. I yep. love Arrested Development. I love Seinfeld. I love Kirby Enthusiasm. What's your favorite sitcom of all those shows? Squidbillies, uh, animated on uh, Adult Swim. It's about early Kyler. He lives in the Georgia mountains. The squid billies. Is what uh, yeah, hold on. Well, give me some squid billies. Uh... Hello, America. This is Ernie Collar from Squid Billies. Woo! Better turn up your radio box. We're about to talk bulldogs, baby. Woo! Go dogs! Second wolf, wolf, wolf. Early made that just special for us. Squid that's billies. My... That's a good. Choice. Fifteen minutes. You're in and you're out. Uh, you know, Seinfeld's great. Um, I loved. I loved Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah. That, that's genius. I mean, high level genius. Um. But I'm not a I'm not a television consumer. I watch yeah. sports on television. I don't watch TV shows. Favorite all time stand up comic? Are you Pryor? Are you Murphy? Richard Lewis? Um, I love Shandling back in the day. Eddie Eddie Murphy was obviously great, and it was at a time when you were young enough that you thought this guy was just you know you thought the Ice Cream Man was the greatest thing ever done. Mm-hmm. Um, I really 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 like Mitch Hedberg. Uh, I think he's just so quirky and odd, and but f- consistently funny. And right now. 
Like Chris Rock's unafraid to say anything, as we saw in that SNL. Doc. <laughs> but I think Louis C.K. Louis and, C. And, and he's in the same place. Right. And he was actually he was on the show once and actually stopped because he had to get a rental car situation sorted out. We were taping it, so we were able to take it out. Uh, Louis C.K. I'd say right now. Yeah, because there's nothing that he's afraid of. Correct. And that's that's one of the big most important things to be in life is fearless. Ernie Harwell, Hall of Fame broadcaster, once said this statement. He said, whenever you start a job as a broadcaster, people are not going to like it. They're not used to it. But after five years, it doesn't matter if you're good. It doesn't matter if you're bad. People just get used to you. Do you agree with that statement? If you last long enough for people to get used to, yes. I think there's I think there's definitely something to be said for that. You, it's, I, I mean, Harwell is... Everyone loved Ernie Harwell, mm-hmm. so it's easy for him to say that. But I do think that if you're that that one but of the, you can hang in there. What are, what are the guys that like Trent Dilfer always tells us? Your greatest asset is your availability, meaning can you play? Well, in ours in our business, can you can you show up to work and you do it long enough? And I think that that I think that there's a lot of truth to that. Also, I think that um, you know that I'm just really likable, so people dig me. I don't know your favorite movie, but I, I've been listening to the show for years, and I know you love going to the well and the, the road to perdition quote. Is that one of your favorite all-time movies? No, there I just love There are only love, murderers in this room. No, I just love yeah. that quote because it's a perfect quote. Yeah. I, I reference it all the time yeah. because it speaks to FIFA. It yeah. speaks to the NCAA. Mm-hmm. It speaks to recruiting in the SEC. And if you've not heard it for the thousandth time, Newman, Paul Newman, tells Tom Hanks in the bottom of a church basement, Hanks is is the hit man that works for his boss. Mm -hmm. Look around, Michael. There are only murderers in this room, (laughs) and there are only the two of them. The point is, don't get moral with me. Don't bring don't bring your don't bring your morality play here about what are we doing. There are only murderers in this room. I like Road to Perdition. It's incredibly dark the way it ends. Really a bummer. That tableau in the rain. It's wow, beautifully shot. But um, you know. I like uh, favorite movies. Snatch is high on the list. God, I love that movie. If you had a choice to do a Sean Connery impression or a Paul Newman impression, I can't do a Paul Newman impression. And if Sean Connery, you, you, all you have to do is just sort of a, 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 a garble. Rah, 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 that's all you do. <laughs> I can't say the one about the prom queen, but that's a great one. Uh, somebody also thought you were a Phoebe Cates fan. I don't know if that's accurate as far as like Sure, <laughs> Phoebe was awesome. Who can, who can forget the scene in uh, Fast Times? You know? Swimming pool, things get oh. things end up going bad for old Judge Reinhold there. Classic. That's a that's a tough one. Good pop quiz, brother. All right, I failed you there. I, I, oh, that's good stuff. I failed you. you on the, I, I, I should have had one. I mean, Emma Stone, and as an old man, I should I should have had one as a kid. Now I'm an adult. I'm like that. Emma Stone looks pretty nice. Hey, how are you, sweetheart? I'm over here. I do a little show. So, suddenly, I turned into, suddenly, suddenly I turned into like Peter Falk. I'm like yes. 90 year old Columbus. Peter Falk That's over here. That's awesome. I love Columbo. All right. <laughs> Off the rails completely and not done yet. Jeremy Schapp thoughts are next. SVP Woo! and Rosillo. I just have something to say about tomorrow night. I have to do Sports Center, and there will not be a, an NBA game. There is no NHL uh, game. So I, I feel like I don't want to. We're going to just do baseball tonight and not do it as well. So I don't know exactly what we're going to do. So in advance, I have I have Thursday angst. I have Thursday angst about uh, what we'll what we'll do. We'll come up with a plan though between now and tomorrow night at, at eleven. As someone who's hosted some shows which are not being watched because there's other better quality entertainment out there, I do get amused by some of the tweets that you'll send when you're in that same position. I remember one time you said something along the lines of we're we're, we're juggling chainsaws yep. and, and guzzling. I don't know if it was a foreign substance. It was an alcohol of some type. Something. Yeah, did, no. You, did that work? Did you see it, people flipping over all of a sudden? No, hey. no, no. You just, I think that you know in our business that if, particularly if it's a show about sports, yeah. not everyone likes the Stanley Cup. Not everybody likes the NBA. Mm-hmm. It's ice cream. People like certain flavors more than others. Mm-hmm. So you know that there'll be a, 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 somebody will straggle into the old saloon to belly up to the bar. <laughs> but I think, you, you know, you have enough self awareness to know. If, if I were at home, would I be watching Levy and Bucci Grass, or would I be watching the game? Right. And they'd be doing the same. Nothing personal. That's all I got. We talked earlier about Mad Max. I know you're going to go check it out with Outsider Mike. But in case you're looking for a TV show, I don't watch a ton of TV because it's mainly movies and sports. But Netflix has a great series called Daredevil. I know Outsider Mike is all in on this. If you haven't seen it, you have some time to binge watch. Vincent D'Onofrio, fantastic as Wilson Fisk, who's Kingpin. 
shades of De Niro in Heat. He has like a love interest, and and he has that real balance between like being this romantic tough guy, but also having this unbelievable menace to him. So I don't watch a ton of comic book stuff, but it's a really good dark brooding show. Check out Daredevil on Netflix. There you go. Highest recommendation. <laughs> What, like, highest recommendation or, like, yeah, go check it out? Oh, with my highest recommendation. Yeah, I, I think you'll enjoy it. That's the ad Nancy seal of approval. <laughs> Earlier, today, Earlier today on SBP and Marcello. We talked about Bob Lee. Oh. He is as identified with soccer as anyone is identified with any sport here. Berman with football. Eh. Eh. Tommy, look. Boot your grass. Eh. The Dino. Bengals. Eh. Look, Marvin Lewis. What? They know who we mean. Nice. Everyone's got a Berman. <laughs> Everyone's got a Berman in their back pocket. That was dueling Bermans <laughs> is what that was. That was dueling. I was doing a Berman. You were doing a Berman. Everyone was just doing a Berman. That was that was interesting. Then I, I Go ahead. I dropped about five. Yeah. And then I had the confidence to actually give an actual line. Yeah. That's, I mean, Day. you start with that, Day. and then the rest is whatever it is. Another question. Does he like the impression you do of him? Is he aware of it? Is he... Scotty, look. <laughs> He's been at this a while. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> no, I have no clue. He's never praised the issue to you. Okay. The blogs. Uh, that's always sort of it. <laughs> hey, boom, you want to go out and grab a meal? And... <laughs> I, yeah, the blogs. Uh, okay. <laughs> then I accused uh, Jeremy Schaap of killing people. He's got a wallet. He's right. got a briefcase. He's got a lot of scarves. And he's got a passport. That's just, it's like a right. foreign identity. He uh, probably speaks like seven different languages. I think. He, he, I, you know what? I think Jeremy Schaaf's a spy. So this is what it's come down to. It went from nice enough for him to come on the show. Now he's he's rooted in espionage. I think he's killed people. I think he's a spy, <laughs> and I think he's killed people. Is what I think about Schaaf. And I'm just glad that he didn't <laughs> off both of us when he came in here talking about FIFA. He knows people that can make things happen. There's no question about that. Uh, he could. He could kill make you. Make a phone call. He could kill you with a pencil, dude. I don't know that any of that is accurate, but it seemed it seemed funny at the time. And then finally, this happened to how do you pre- how do you properly pronounce that country's name? Oh. The question that Scott and I raised earlier is: Is this Cutter mess, not Qatar? Cutter, twenty twenty two. I say Qatar. Thank but, you. But I, that's that's what I say. That's what I was taught. I was there. Right. The people Bro- I Bro- know. Brokaw said it sixteen different times I, I, over the course of about five months, I, and I defer to him, and I, I just don't know where to go. You know, I, I I didn't correct Bob Lee. Bob's got his way of doing <laughs> right. it. David Lloyd's got his way. <laughs> I go with Qatar, and I'm committed to that. I love it. I'm now back all in on Qatar. No, Qatar. <laughs> okay, good, good, Qatar. Qatar. I'll give up now. I'm going to ask you this question. Please. How do you how do you pronounce the name of that country? Qatar. See, he went Qatar. Qatar. Remember, bro, call was like Goddard. <laughs> it, it, it became it a completely different variety. Goddard. It became Goddard, and I don't know what it is. And Qatar doesn't. Qatar feels false. It's Qatar. You know what that is, dude? East, yeah. East Coast bias. No, that is, we got that is, e- we have East we have East Coast bias, and we can't say I don't know how to say the name of the country. I just I know that they shouldn't have the World Cup there. I did want to ask you: you ever throw out the first pitch at an Orioles game? Not an Orioles game, a minor league game. Yeah. That has to happen. This guy's a huge Orioles fan. Make it happen. If they ask, I'll go down there and I will fire a knuckleball that'll knock somebody's junk in the dirt. Miguel Cabrera leads the Detroit Tigers into Anaheim to face Mike Trout and the Los Angeles Angels. The pregame's at 7 Eastern, followed by first pitch at 8, Sunday on ESPN2 and on ESPN Radio.